people. Get them going. They'll, they could use a union. If you believe in a union, then do it. Organize them. <coughs> Last year, I think I told you, hire me. Let's get right to work in. In two years, we'll have 50,000 union members back in Missouri. Good paying jobs. It can be done. <laughs> I love this state. I, I love unions. The, without unions, we wouldn't have nothing in this country. But I also believe in freedom of choice. And uh, I'm sure appreciate Representative Curtis for introducing a right to work bill. I appreciate him. That's all I have to say. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Can we hear from Brian Kelly, please? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, committee members. I think my legs are asleep, so I'm... <laughs> It's been a long days, so I'll, I'll try and uh, move right along here. Uh, one of the things I want to tell you is my name is Brian Kelly. I'm with the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen. We were founded in 1863. We're the oldest labor union in North America. So I take a lot of pride in that. 152 years this year. I, I like to say that for another reason. We've been around a while, but we're planning on staying is with great disappointment and frustration that I appear here in front of you today to once again testify against anti-labor legislation. This is my ninth year coming to the Capitol, and sadly I rarely have a chance to testify in support of a bill that will help us as workers and employees, but too often have the opportunity to speak against bills like this one that are designed and drafted, I believe, to hurt us. This bill is unnecessary and I believe unfair. Ever since I first arrived down here, the litmus test, any bill must pass by most legislators I have spoken with, is whether or not it is necessary. This bill is unnecessary since employees cannot be forced to join a union. They can be required to pay a fee in lieu of. Having a union at work location is part of an agreement that has to be signed by the employer and ratified by a majority of the employees themselves. The employees can vote to do away with their union if they choose as you guys heard when you heard about decertification. So they have the right to not even have one if the majority so deems. Making these agreements illegal is not going to help stimulate our Missouri economy, and I believe it will in fact hamper it. The single biggest economic boon I know of in recent years in the Show Me State is a new stamping plant that Ford built just three miles south of my house in Liberty. That plant was built <clears throat> by the collaborative work of state legislators, local officials, and equally important Ford Motor <coughs> Company and the United Auto Workers. We need more success stories like this one, and it should be the model we strive for. However, I believe this legislation could make future advancements like that one in Liberty illegal. This bill, I believe, is unnecessary. I believe it is unfair for the government to tell two private parties, in this case a business and a union, that they cannot reach an agreement between the two entities that puts requirements on employees if that is the best business model for that company or corporation and for that group of workers. How is it fair for the government to intervene in these agreements? How is it fair for them to deem these agreements illegal and even assess fines and penalties on the two parties when these contracts have been the norm for decades? This is government overreach and I believe that makes this bill unfair. I also believe it's unfair because I think it allows uh, the workers to freeload. And I know you don't like that term, but we're required by federal law to represent all our members, and they're not all required to pay their fair share. And you think that's fair? Now I'd like to ask you, my representative's not in here, but I'll ask him in his office. I'd like to ask you to do the same thing for our taxes. Give us a chance to opt out. And, and, and you guys are gonna be required to represent us Come down here, get cleaned up like I tried to today, and represent us without without having a tax base to fund your efforts. Because basically that's what it's going to do to us. We're not going to have the funds to come down here and be a voice for our people. I'm a locomotive engineer. I'm in, I'm in my 39th year at the railroad. I'm not a professional speaker, as you probably already noticed. But by God, I'm going to come down here and be a voice for my people and speak up. Because that's what I was elected to do. And as far as these uh, remarks about union bosses, 
I am proud to be the highest ranking union officer in the state of Missouri. Damn proud. I am not a boss, I am a servant. And I serve my members honorably and proudly, and I'm thankful to do it every single day, and I've done it for 20 years. I'll answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. James, is it Coy? Right. My name is James Coyne, and I'm the president of the Mid-Missouri Patriots. Um, we're a citizens organization uh, in Columbia based on individual liberty and equality under the law. Um, there are two critical civil rights that I believe every individual worker in Missouri should enjoy. The first is the right to control his own property, or his income. The second is the right to express his own political and religious convictions. Both of these rights are being trampled on in our state. First, workers' property is taken in the form of forced union dues. These workers, only, these workers only choice is to join the union and pay or not work at all, which is no choice. Additionally, these forced dues can be used by the union to support candidates and policies that the worker himself believes are wrong and harmful to his family and his nation. Whether that involves the support of the heavy hand of government through Obamacare, the loss of jobs and security through illegal immigration, or the taking of life through abortion on demand, it is abhorrent to force a man to pledge his money to what he believes is wrong. This practice is the antithesis of the rights of any individual in a free country and a slap in the face to freedom of conscience. The bill before us removes the compulsion to join a union as a condition of going to work. It also stops workers' dues from being forcibly taken from them and then used for purposes they do not condone. Any organization ha should have to earn the allegiance of its members not force them to join. If this bill becomes law, union membership and its dues would be voluntary. Unions would have to produce positive results for its membership to grow and could not take them for granted. They would have to be responsive to the wants of their members. This bill will not hurt unions, but rather make them better. It will restore control of the fruits of the workers' labor where it rightfully should have always been. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Representative. Mr. Chip. I'm curious, can you think of an occupation in the state of Missouri that one has to be a union member in order to perform? I believe that would be a closed shop, wouldn't it, Steve? No, I mean, I'm not, I don't mean that. I mean, in terms of, you can be a cashier in a union shop, you can be through, you can be finding a job as a cashier in a non-union shop. Is there a type of occupation that you have, in the state of Missouri, a classification of occupation? If you're, if you're gonna be a construction worker, you can choose to be a union constructor, construction worker, you can choose to be a non-union construction worker. Is there a type of work in the state of Missouri that the alternative does not exist to be a non-union member? Yeah, like I just said, a closed shop. It's not a, it's, no. Yes, I, I, but I'm asking, is, is there another? Oh, could you, yeah, could you work someplace else? Just, uh, I guess you could tell the worker to just shut up and, uh, you know, keep his opinions to himself, go work someplace else. Is that what you're saying? I'm asking, 
right now for any occupation. Yeah, well, that I just told you. Asian. I just answered your question. You just didn't no, like the way I answered it. Is there not a choice? I'm asking, can you name a single occupation? Name an example of a clothes shop. What type of occupation would that be? I don't know. Why don't you tell me? <laughs> my, my premise of my question depends on you being able to name an occupation. Yeah. Well, what is the premise of your question? Which I asked is, is there a single occupation in the state of Missouri that a worker does not, cannot participate in, does not have a choice to participate in? I don't think your question is germane to my testimony. Did you not understand my point? No, I didn't. That's why I asked the question. Really? <laughs> Do you have any? If you want to be a nurse, you can work in a, in a, in a non-union atmosphere. If you want to be a teacher, you don't have to join. Is there a single occupation that you are required to be a union in, in the state of Missouri in order to perform? As I said, I was, I was referring to forced unionization in a closed shop. Right, and I'm asking, yeah. do you have a choice right now as, as a worker in the state of Missouri to pursue any occupation you want without being involved in a union? I don't know. You tell me. Yeah. Well, I'm asking you to write an example of what you know. I mean, I, what, what, what is your point? I don't know where you're going with this. You might be the only one in the room that doesn't know what yeah. it is. <laughs> or maybe you are. That's how long we were, I yeah. think. Uh, I think. Anyway. We what, end with this. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Sir. Uh, Reverend Martin Rafina, is that correct? Rafina. Rafina. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, my name is Martin Rafanat. I'm a member of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and ordained minister in that church body for 38 years. Uh, and also have a call to work with um, uh, low wage workers across the state uh, through Missouri Jobs with Justice. Also, here with a couple of other ministers from St. Louis, this is Emma Baker and um, also Sherry Saunders. Uh, we're just here, I am here to um, deliver uh, a, a signed uh, letter from 270 faith leaders across the state of Missouri opposing these two pieces of legislation, right to work in general. Um, we believe that um, uh, given the testimony today, uh, very much so we believe that this uh, legislation really uh, lowers wages in our in our state. Uh, it uh, undermines the ability of workers to organize and collectively bargain. Um, it really takes away voice from workers, um, and it makes our workplaces less safe. Uh, and as a minister of the gospel in this community, uh, I stand with workers. I want them to have the opportunity to organize and collectively bargain. Uh, having been the director of Gateway 180, Homelessness Reverse, the state's largest shelter for women and children for five years, one out of five of the women in our shelter were working full-time or more, uh, but in poverty wage jobs. The result of which is that these women were in a shelter, even though they were working full-time. Uh, they needed to use government assistance, food stamps, earned income tax credit, um, health care assistance in order just to survive and take care of their families. They didn't want to do that, but they had to do that. I am for making sure that these women and people like them in our middle class and those who are poor and in need have the opportunity to fight for better wages, to fight for better working conditions, and to have jobs which allow them to live a fully respectful human lives in our communities. Emmett? I'm Reverend Dr. Emmett Baker Jr. I represent the St. Louis Clergy Coalition, National African American Fellowship for Southern Baptist Convention for the State of Missouri. I've heard people come up here who support this legislation use this word moral. But my moral conviction starts with the gospel. I remember in Matthew 25 and 40 where Jesus says, What you do for the least of these, you do also unto me. This legislation will never help the least of these. It will do more to undermine everybody here who is lesser employed now and especially in the ethnic community. In the ethnic community, this gives a right to discriminate. It doesn't give a right to employment. It gives a right to react to the cronyism and the patriotism that goes back to where you're going all about family members and family heritage and hiring people that you feel privileged to hire. And it would put that 
ethnic communities out of work. It would hurt the faith-based community and my congregation and the congregation that I represent. As the statement says, I've seen the lightning flash. I've heard the thunder roar. And I know that Jesus is telling me to fight on. To fight on. We must continue to fight on. And we hope that some of you legislators in here call yourself moral and call yourself Christian, but look around at some of the people that you will be unempowered, people that you will be putting out of employment, people who will be forced to work for labor. This country was built upon slave labor. When slave labor came out, they took it to the lower countries and all over the third world, and now they want to bring it back here. Heard the man talk about the pumpkins. Are uh, you going to make pumpkins in here for the same wages you pay the people in Missouri? I don't think so. Is that what you're trying to get us back to? If that's it, oh hell no. We're against that. God bless you. Good afternoon. My name is Cherie Saunders. I'm an associate minister with the AME Zion Church, and I'm also a cabinet member of Interfaith Partnership. Right to work has no place in Missouri or any other state. The very concept of right to work is a smokescreen to keep workers oppressed and depressed. It grants CEOs, special interest politicians, and the corporate world the right to pay inferior wages and have horrific working conditions. Right to work extinguishes hope and causes a climate of despair for working families and communities. Workers are disrespected by means of wages and unsafe working conditions. A worker's dignity is challenged, and the atrocity is that right to work, there is no accountability. Workers are harassed and fired without reason, and it's because those that are in power do not have to answer anyone. As a Christian, I was raised by the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Would CEOs and special interest politicians want to be treated the way they treat their workers? Would a CEO accept low wages, poor working conditions, and disrespect? I encourage a spirit of fairness and human decency, which can only be accomplished with the abolishing of any right to work legislation. I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Um, for anyone who is testifying, uh, we do need to have the uh, forms filled out, please. <coughs> you do that, I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Stan Greer, would you please testify? Okay, I have my form. I'm going to, uh, just to give a little background, my name is uh, Stan Greer, I guess I'll put it right here, and uh, I work for the uh, National Right to Work Committee in the Washington, D.C. area, and also for the affiliated uh, research organization, National Institute for Labor Relations Research. Uh, unlike the committee, the Institute does not take stands for or against legislation. And although I work part of the time for the committee and I'm not, obviously I'm telling you this up front, so I'm not downplaying any connection between the committee and the Institute, closely connected, but the Institute does not lobby for or against legislation. So although what I'm going to say is certainly supportive of right to work legislation, I'm not, I'm not testifying in favor of the right to work legislation today. I'm giving information. And mostly, I'm just trying to try to address, in the however much time I've given, uh, a lot of the things that we've heard today. And I would like to briefly address, I mean, one important thing that I think needs to be emphasized is personal experience is really important, but we can't base public policy on whether or not a particular person had a good experience with the union or a bad experience with the union. Because, and, and we hear, we've been hearing a lot today about employers who've had good experiences with the union. Well, that's great, but you know, the, the direct purpose that we're considering here today is what's good for employees, not what's good for employers. So that's, the, that's the, what I think should be the primary focus here. And 
I, I know there are, that we have the witnesses here who have one experience, but I think it's worth pointing out that there are many uh, uh, minorities over the years in America who've had very bad experiences with unions, and particularly bad experiences with unions exercising what I regard as monopoly power under federal law. So when the Congress was first considering the National Industrial Recovery Act in the 1930s, which is a precursor to the National Labor Relations Act that we have today, and was going to establish unions as exclusive bargaining agents like what we have today, W.E.B. Du Bois, who was one of the co-founders of the NAACP and uh, one of the leading figures in, in American civil rights history, he was strongly against it because he realized that the result of this was going to be to, to take jobs away from minorities, and specifically the black people that he was, you know, he was one of them, and, uh, and give them often to, to a white union member. So he said that uh, the AFL has always said that it's for organizing the black man, but that's a lie. In fact, the, the AFL has tried to deny jobs to black men and to knock them off the jobs whenever they could, and uh, they tried to achieve the uh, freedom at the expense of the black man. I don't, I don't remember if that's, you might have used the term colored man. It was different terminology back in those days. But anyway, the point is the same. Many uh, minorities, and not just in W.B. Du Bois' time, but in more recent times, in the 1970s, we had, we had one of the representatives here say, well, have unions ever been against uh, civil rights legislation? Well, actually, in the 1970s, you know, well into the civil rights era, the AFL-CIO went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and it was the Nixon Court, and they succeeded in getting a reinterpretation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which said that if you have a seniority policy that's negotiated under a union contract that may well have the effect of hurting minorities because they tend not to be the incumbent, but there's not evidence, you can't prove that it's discriminatory in, in intent, then that union contract is permissible under, under the Civil Rights Act. And uh, civil rights leaders at the time were appalled by that. Herbert Hill, who was the head of the uh, labor policy for the AFL-CIO, I'm sorry, for the NAACP, he was opposed to the AFL-CIO on this issue, he said that the, uh, the AFL-CIO used the Supreme Court to gut the Civil Rights Act. Now we don't have maybe quite as many problems quite like this nowadays, but certainly union contracts tend overwhelmingly to favor incumbent employees over non-incumbent employees, and employees with a lot of seniority over employees with less seniority, and very frequently, minority groups are the employees who, as a practical matter, have less seniority, and therefore, they're hurt by the union contract. So they might have a good reason to believe that they're less well off as a union contract than they would be uh, without one. And I want to now move on to the more general question of freedom of association, because we've had a lot of debate about that, and we've had representatives here say, oh, no, uh, the current policy of forced unionism in uh, Missouri, that's not against freedom of association. You've got it all wrong. Well, let's imagine, well, first let's, let's review a little bit what current federal labor law says and also the law of every single state with regard to employees who aren't covered by federal labor law. What the law says is that you can't have an agreement between an employer and employees assuming the majority of employees don't want a union, that says that no employee, nobody who wants a job there, who wants to keep working there, can join a union, or that nobody who wants to keep working there, well, maybe they can join a union, but they have to pay dues, they can't pay dues or fees to the union. That would be, that's illegal, that's been illegal for a long, long time in the United States. And some of our representatives here will say, well, that should be okay, right? Because uh, you should be able to discriminate against somebody for wanting to join a union because he can always go get a job somewhere else where he's unionized. Well, that's not what federal policy is. That's not what state policy is. That's still illegal because it's not considered to be kosher to have a policy discriminating against somebody for wanting to join a union or wanting to pay dues or fees to a union and say, oh, well, you can join a union, but you can't pay any money to a union. Would that be a real right to join the union if you could be you couldn't be fired for joining it, but you could be fired for paying money to the union. I don't think you would have a real right to join the union under those circumstances, would you? And similarly, under current policy in Missouri, when you can be fired 
you, you don't have to join the union, but you have to pay dues that may be as high as full union dues. And if you don't, then you're fired. You don't have a real right not to join the union under those circumstances. And the fact that you could go get a non-union job somewhere else doesn't make it any more right than the fact that a, that a worker who wants to join the union, it would make it right if you were fired for joining the union and oh, if you always go get a union job. That's still illegal. It's still considered wrong. So I totally disagree with the perspective of the representatives who say that as long as you can go get a job somewhere uh, that's, that's uh, non-union, that it's okay for unionism to be compulsory as a, as a condition of employment. I want to talk a little bit about the so-called uh, free rider argument and, uh, and the so-called uh, majority rule argument, too. What we have, just to review a little bit, under federal labor policy is if a union seeks and obtains the power to be the exclusive bargaining agent of all the employees or all the frontline employees at a business, then it becomes the bargaining agent for all those employees whether they choose as individuals to join the union or not. As a couple of witnesses have pointed out that I want to emphasize, it is absolutely clear under U.S. Supreme Court decisions such as the Lady Garmer, Garmer Workers' Decision of 1961 or 62 and the uh, Consolidated Edison Decision of 1938 that unions have a right under federal law to negotiate not to seek and obtain exclusive bargaining power but simply to negotiate a union, uh, a contract with the employer in which they represent their members only. They can do this if the union constitutes a minority of the employees at the workplace or if the union constitutes a majority of the employees at the workplace as was the case in the Consolidated Edison case. So it's not the case that unions have to negotiate contracts in which they represent everybody. They want to negotiate contracts in which they represent everybody. And it's not necessarily because they have the good of, I, I, don't, I don't want to be, you know, say unions necessarily have bad intentions, but we've heard, actually, even the, the pro-right-to-work side have been bending over backwards in many cases to say how, how great the motives of union officials are. And I'm not saying they aren't great sometimes, but just like everybody else, they are human, and their motives are not always great. So uh, when it came before Congress, legislation came before Congress just uh, a couple years ago, in 2012 actually, uh, there was legislation that was designed to slightly modify union contracts that are currently negotiated under federal law, because right now the union has the power to negotiate the same pay for everybody uh, who's considered to be a similar employee as far as the union, uh, union de determines it. And the employer can't go below that, and the employer can't go above that. Now, I should mention that if the union agrees to it, then the employer can go above it. So one well-known example is, is Hollywood, right? You know, Tom Hanks is unionized, but Tom Hanks doesn't get paid union scale. And the union's okay with it because the union gave the studio the permission to pay Tom Hanks more. But that doesn't happen so often with ordinary employees. So what this bill would have done is it would have said that an employer can't pay less than the union, con less than the union contract for unionized employees, but it can pay more for individual employees who are represented by the union as long as the employer has some kind of concrete evidence that that employee has contributed something that means he's creating greater value than the other employees. Mr. Greer, I hate to cut you short, but we still have a lot of, a lot of people need to testify. Okay, I'm, I'm willing to, the, the, I'll just very briefly say, the unions shot that down. So part of the purpose of, of, of exclusivity is that unions want the opportunity to deny employers the opportunity to pay employees who are especially productive or contribute a lot more than other employees. And that's one of many good reasons why an individual employee might think he doesn't benefit from unionism and shouldn't be forced to pay dues if he doesn't want to join. Thank you, sir. Mr. Stacklehouse, could we hear from you, please? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, committee. I'm uh, uh, here to advocate uh, in support of House Bill 116. 
My name is David Stackelhaus. I'm currently uh, retired. Before retirement, I worked uh, in the area of the corporate business world, primarily in corporate finance, for about 43 years. I have a degree in business administration accounting from the University of uh, North Dakota and a Master of Business Administration from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. After my graduation, I received a commission in the Army and spent two years in the service. After my service in 1967, I joined Alice Calvers Corporation. It's a large, diversified Fortune 500 company. I spent 22 years with Alice Chalmers. As I progressed up through the ranks in Alice Chalmers, I was promoted to the position of Manager of Strategic Planning. It's a corporate staff position located in the headquarters uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. In that capacity, I worked with the corporate officers and other staff people in developing corporate-wide plans, which included plant and facility placements throughout the United States. I worked closely with the director of real estate and construction and other officers, and as we reviewed uh, development plans and proposed plans that affected the entire uh, Alice Chalmers Corporation. The director of real estate and construction and other staff positions that were responsible for the placement of corporate facilities across America had a policy of not placing any plant in a right that was not a right to work state. Uh, it was a corporate position and I realized uh, how important then that a right to work state was. And bear in mind this was about 20 some years ago. Basically no facility would be considered in any state that was not a right to work state. I can't speak for the corporate policies of other corporations, but as I watched uh, in Missouri here, uh, as it had been passed by many times for new facilities, I watched the automotive plants uh, being located in other states. While we've lost automotive plants in Missouri, uh, geographically, Missouri is an ideal state uh, a modern, for a large modern manufacturing facility. It has excellent roads, rail lines, abundant cheap power, has a large educated population, and a, a skilled workforce with a manufacturing history, and yet we seem to get passed over for all of these major manufacturing plants. I suspect many corporations have a quiet policy against locating in a forced unionism state. And I think we've heard some testimony here today from others that have pretty much confirmed the same thing. I watched as the Nissan Motor Company placed a large facility in Canton, Mississippi, in Smyrna, Tennessee, and there were many other plants and placements across America by other corporations, and we're not getting them here in Missouri. We certainly should have gotten some of those new plants and uh, that have been added across America in the past 20 years. So I encourage Missouri to become a right to work state. Uh, thank you for your time and are there any questions? Thank you, sir. Shannon Cooper, would you please? Whew. I am wore out, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Shannon Cooper today proudly representing the Carter's District Council. I tell you what, this hearing reminds me of some of the days long ago when uh, one of your former members used to hold marathon, marathon hearings like this, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wasn't even going to testify today. I spent the weekend thinking about what to say. Last year I told a very personal story. Don't want to do it again. And I can read the tea leaves. Uh -oh. That could be a sign. Thank you. I can bet you right now, with more accuracy than the Las Vegas odd makers had last night on the Super Bowl, of how this vote's going to turn out. I'm not stupid. I've been where you've been. And I know how next week's gonna, vote's going to turn out. And I've got a pretty good idea how the week after that vote is going to turn out. And I don't know what I can do. You've heard more facts and statistics and acronyms. Holy smoke. My head's about to explode with all that. Some of it I have no idea what people were even talking about. It just I'm amazed. But and again, I just I was trying to put my testimony together and, and like many of our members, I got up at 3 30 this morning, Mr. Chairman. 
Left Henry County at 4.30, I had to make a delivery to Research Hospital. As I was going up 7 Highway, cut through representing Bratton's area, I started noticing pickup trucks passing me. Those were my people. But even Henry County, Bates County, going up to work at Kansas City, because that's where the jobs were at. They'd all love to be at home where they could have stayed in bed till 6.30, gone to work at 7.30. But they were on the road, just like me. I got up for research, dropped off my package. First person I saw was the nurse in the admitting room. You know who the second person I saw was? Union carpenter, a floor layer. Up 15 degrees this morning. No telling where I came from. Didn't have a clue what's going on here today. He's just happy to put in hard day's work and be treated fair. That's all you guys ask for. Pretty simple. And, and I don't know what to tell those people. When, when we had a call Thursday, a lot of our members said, why? Tell me, Shannon, why are they picking on us when our schools are graduating kids that can't read or write above an eighth grade level? Why are they picking on us for making a decent wage with retirement and health insurance? And the roads I got to travel back and forth to my jobs are falling apart. And why, after what this state's been put through this summer, the national press and the media, and you all know what I'm talking about. Why do you want to take away the best opportunity for a lot of those people in those unfortunate situations? And I don't know what to tell them. I just don't know what to say. And I'm going to walk out of this Capitol tonight dejected, but I won't be defeated. And I'm going to get on that call with our clients. And for one of the first times in my life when they ask me why, I don't know what to tell them. Be happy to answer questions, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chairman, I guess I elevated you, didn't I? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, Michelle Roberts Bond, is that correct? Hi, I'm Michelle Roberts Bauer with Associated Builders and Contractors, Heart of America chapter. Um, I, I am registered as a lobbyist, so I'm going to tell you that. Uh, I would be very brief. I just want to say that we are in support of the bills that are proposed um, because we do not believe that an individual should be required to pay union dues or fees. Thank you very much. Uh, Ron Staggs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to be brief. I have a larger prepared statement, but to answer some of the questions that have been brought forth, uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruling the Beck case has been referenced here. Um, fairness, free ride has been referenced here. Uh, I'd like to address a few things. Also, it's nice that the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers was here to testify, and I believe this representative brought up something about the uh, contributions from the unions to the PACs, political PACs. The Federal Election